Good morning, everyone, and thanks for making time again to uh, lis listen to our Thursday um, Overberg um, group um, talks, Zoom talks. And I'd like to introduce today Bastion Lenol. Um, Bastion qu qualified in geology and ge geophysics in France and started a PhD with Martin de Witt um, in 2008, and he graduated in 2013. Since then, he's been a research fellow and a postdoc at, at Aon Esri. Um, it's an institute which is now based in the geology department um, at the Nelson Mandela University, and, and he'll tell us a bit more about that after the presentation. His, his research focuses on African Gondwana technonic, tectonics, climate change, sea level changes, geomorphology, and, and stratigraphy of the various um, basins, both in the Karoo and the coastal areas. He's done work in the, in, in the Karoo, the Congo, and the Kalahari basins up north. And he also teaches field schools to third years and honors. Um, he's also done some, some really interesting work um, with drones and drone technology for field mapping. And he'll give us a little bit of insight into that later on as well. So I'd like to welcome Bastian, and we look forward to your presentation, um, Bastian. Good luck. Yeah, thanks, John. So I kept the title uh, you uh, signed me in for, Pillow Talk, A New Look at Volcanic Feature Near the Base of the Karoo Levas in Lesotho and Surrounds. So the first slide is the base of the Karoo Lava. You can see the the contact or the transition between the, the sandstone at the top of the Karoo in the Drakensberg mountain and then the basalt. Here we are at Lundin's Neck, that's, uh, that's the border between uh, South Africa and uh, Lesotho. So yeah, there's not a real outline, but I just wanted to uh, try to explain how do I get to study this uh, particular contact. I started uh, by first coming in Africa, and then in 2008, I started my PhD with Martin uh, David. He sent me to the Congo in that, uh, if you can see my mouse, in that little area there. Um, this was following a paper he wrote uh, on the Congo River and the possibility that the Congo River was first flowing in the Indian Ocean before flying, uh, flowing into the Atlantic today. And he had some collaboration uh, with the French, the German, so that was sponsoring a lot of my PhD. And part of it was a project called Topo Africa. So that was a collaboration between my French uni university and the university uh, in South Africa. The results of that was uh, in 2015, after my PhD and a postdoc, the publication of this book on the Congo Basin, which uh, I'm very happy to have been part of that, and it's a great um, source of, um, of uh, updated information on the Congo, which is a region that uh, many people don't know a lot about. Uh, <clears throat> so this was where I got dropped um, by helicopter in the Congo area. Uh, it's an area that is covered with a lot, of course, of uh, jungles and uh, and in places you found our crop of uh, red sandstone. So you can see, um, I was doing most of my field work along the river because there is no roads and the access is very difficult. So I've described most of the outcrop, crop, uh, such as this one, this uh, red cliffs. Uh, it's a Jurassic Cretaceous sandstone. Uh, so here are some picture from the field. Um, it was in 2008. This was really made possible because of uh, a group of very uh, young and energetic uh, local people. Here are two of them, which with who I was working every day. And I was part of uh, a company in the Congo area that uh, was um, led by Mike Davids um, called BSC Diamond Co. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful I had this opportunity to spend six months camping with these guys. And you see they were uh, really helping me uh, cleaning one of the outcrop. Uh, from the grass. So on the left here, you have a map of uh, the different outcrop I visited during these six months. And really my main uh, take out of this, uh, of this field work was that I was able to measure 200 and something uh, paleo wind direction. So I recognize in many places that the cross bedding was aeolian feature and that the wind was blowing uh, towards the southwest and the south in this uh, area. And uh, later on, I um, was able to make the connection with the uh, Botucatu sandstone in South Brazil, 
where there is aeolian dunes that are well preserved under a lava flow that is dated around 132 million years and we which have uh, paleo wind direction that are very similar uh, to the sandstone I've mapped in Congo. So it was the main correlation was to be able to propose an age for the sandstone in the Congo based on this correlation with the sandstone under the 132 million years lava in, uh, in Brazil, in near Porto Alegre. So this was a good time of uh, my research during my PhD. Afterwards, uh, <clears throat> I also had a good time in the Parnaiba Basin. I went to visit some of the outcrop, and here again, uh, you can see on that map the basalts are lighted in black, so they, they are basalt of similar age, and underneath again we found uh, aeolian sandstone. Uh, you can see on the right the schematic uh, section, there is aeolian sandstone here, here are the two basalt, and then there is aeolian sandstone again here, so these basalts are more or less well dated. Uh, it's similar, 200 million years or 130 million years. So um, this, so this is to uh, illustrate a little bit what is really driving my research and what I like to do is to think about this connection between Africa, South America, and possibly other continents that I may have the chance to visit, like Madagascar and uh, as far as uh, Australia, and that's following the uh, imaginary work of Alex Dutoy, and um, so that's really what passionate me. So in that map, I've added some dots on the old map of Dutoy to link the Karoo Basin, the um, Parana Basin with the Congo. So I've added this dot, here's the Parnaiba Basin. Um, some things have changed, now we know better the, the geometry of the fold belt in, uh, in South America and uh, South Africa. Now some people are moving the Falkland Island more towards the uh, Eastern Cape. And uh, we also have good, uh, good data on the collision in the north of, uh, of Gondwana. So um, yeah, this was a slide that, uh, for, from a, a conference where I've uh, described this correlation between the basin. And this is just to share with you that's what I really like is that looking at this geology, we can think about uh, how did Gondwana split apart and how did this break up, cool down climate and then uh, life uh, evolved around that. Um, so this was the old map. Uh, these are my new maps um, using some more modern software. On the right, you can see the sedimentary package that I'm studying in the Cape Karoo, the Congo, the Parnaiba, the Parana, and try to link they, they record really of climate and tectonics to try to understand this, uh, this change in uh, global tectonics. Here on the left, you see Gondwana is one supercontinent. And as we open up the, the different ocean, then we, we are left with Africa and the separate basin. So as a cartoon here is a sort of a general correlation between the four basins. And in yellow, you have the Aeolian uh, sandstone that I were uh, showing pictures of. So here in the Congo, it's more uh, at the boundary between Jurassic Cretaceous. In the Parnaiba, you have Aeolian sandstone of different age. In the Parana, you also have uh, two different sequences of Aeolian sandstone. And in the Karoo, which is the focus of this talk, you have the Aeolian sandstone, which is named the Clarence Formation. It is above the Moltino Elliot formation and then it is covered by the Drakensberg group. So this is really the um, uh, 101 uh, geology of South Africa and this is really most what people mostly um, uh, are aware of. They may uh, have uh, some little unconformity between this formation. Um, there is some data about the paleo wind in the Clarence formation but it's very basic. Uh, it's very basic. Um, and this basic uh, tree formation plus uh, volcanic at the top, it tells us about all the history between the Permian Triassic boundary and um, I guess today uh, Africa. So it includes the eruption of uh, large igneous province and it includes uh, also um, the extinction of the dinosaur and then the global cooling. Um, so this is the old Georgi map of uh, South Africa. I believe now there is a new version by the, by the council, but it has not changed much. 
Um, in the, so this is the outline of the Karoo Basin in brown. In the middle, you have the Beaufort and the uh, uh, Moltino, Elliot and Clarence formation in orange. And this is covered at the top in purple by the uh, basaltic lava. Associated to this uh, basalt, you have a lot of dorite here all across the Karoo Basin. And it's not very well shown on this map. You also have dorite in the, in the basalt um, in Lesotho. So the next map I'm showing is a, is a zoom up of my field area here in the uh, Eastern Cape, I think. I know first is some pictures of the, of the Drakensberg. So it's my, one of, it's my favorite place in South Africa to go in the field. Uh, here you can see it because there is a great adventure to be made there. There are huge canyons. There is no one living around. And uh, yeah, to get across uh, takes you a bit of rock climbing and nice hiking. So I really enjoyed that. I'm discovering there's lots of rock painting on the left. So these are very beautiful. It's places where um, there is uh, many things to visit and do some hiking trails. So yeah, I took my sister. It's a place where you can bring your family for fishing or uh, many different activities. Uh, what else do we have on this picture? Yeah, if you're lucky, you can drive here above the clouds. So that's something I really um, uh, enjoyed uh, seeing that view. It's also very um, pristine and uh, it's probably one of the limited number of places where you can just pull out your car and then camp on the side of the road um, if you don't find accommodation. And then here at the bottom, that's just to make you remember that, uh, yeah, in many places there is very... Uh, little inhabitant, but when you meet one of them or two, uh, they're normally very friendly and uh, it's quite a shock of culture uh, to, to meet these people that are um, staying on the top of this mountain. I found them very happy. I don't know if it's the altitude or um, if they uh, have a different kind of, um, of a food, but um, yeah, it's, um, it's very lovely to go there. So I would encourage you all to uh, to visit uh, this place. Now, I think in the old days it was called Basutu, um, but I don't really know about the, the culture in, in these countries. But yeah, uh, here's my uh, database. So I've digitized quite a lot of things uh, for this area. In yellow are all the spots that I've visited so far, or most of them. So it's quite a, a long, uh, uh, it's going to be quite a long project to, to, if we want to map the contact, you see there's like thousands of kilometers to, to visit. So I've been to a few places. Um, this is work that I've been doing since I'm in uh, Nelson Mandela University. So it's only about the past seven or eight years or so. Uh, most of the place uh, you found very uh, friendly farmers and local people that are inviting you to your, to their place, uh, especially, uh, so there's a lot of, uh, former in the Berkeley East area. So this is an easy place to access. There are over more difficult places around Matatiele where there is uh, a lot of um, uh, community living there. And then on the other side here, I remember going to a place near Zastron. I didn't really put a point here because some of the former were, were chased me with my class uh, at gunpoint. So um, my students were not very impressed. But otherwise, yeah, it's a fantastic place to visit. Uh, you see, I've done quite a few stops at the contact here in the south. And this year, I'm planning to go a lot more in Lesotho, visit that valley. Um, so a uh, different of, uh, kind of uh, rock type. These are uh, taken from the old geological map. Um, in Lesotho, it was done by the British. And in South Africa, it's mostly based on the work of Dutoy. So you see, there's only like three or four units above the sandstone. And then above it, uh, you have the, uh, I mean, above it, cross-cutting it, you have a lot of red dikes. We saw the door, right? Uh, which are well dated at 183 million years. So that's what gives us the relative stratigraphy is that the purple is um, uh, likely to be older than 183 million years. And the few dates we have, you can see they're not very precise. They're between 180 and one. Uh, and almost 200 in the in the purple. The, the geochronology is really not very precise for, for the basalt. But uh, for the dorites, uh, here is a date from one of our last students. They are very precise. It's 183.0 and here 183.2. So all the reds are very well uh, dated in places, while the purple, the basalt, is quite um, poorly constrained in age. 
Um, yeah, yeah, so but it's it stays above the uh, Clarence formation, uh, which is mapped in many places. In some places, it's missing, uh, but it's generally thought that the Drakensberg group uh, overlay conformably the the Clarence sandstone. So that's the the question that I'm asking. The first question is: Is it really conformable? So for to do that, um, I'm using some aerial pictures that you can get for the country and then uh, go on and uh, map. So this was uh, last year field trip. Uh, in about an afternoon, you can cover about that much. Uh, that's like uh, five kilometers because there are quite some big canyon to go through. So you can see the contact is very sharp. It does not really follow uh, completely the, the topography. And this is a place, uh, yeah, I've shown that place because they have a lake, it's called the Vrederus Farm. They have some very beautiful rock painting and uh, yeah, I encourage everyone to stay there. We had a very nice stay, the farmer were very happy to have us, they even offered us to stay. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful landscape. So if you have a chance to pass by this, it's near Maclear. Uh, it's a great place also to have holiday. Um, so yeah, um, over the past few years, I've been tracking this contact. So you can see in the landscape on the top, these are the same pictures, but you can easily spot it in the field. You have a white uh, rock and above it, you have the layered basalt. So you just have to go where it changed. So it's, the change is very well marked. So here you can see it's very, very sharp. Uh, it's difficult to uh, have a conformity that is so sharp. Uh, so here's a detail. Here again, it's a form, Glendoon form. Uh, I remember very well the people asked me without me asking anything. They even invited me for dinner. So it was a fantastic uh, place to, to go and uh, visit that contact. And I did a rock climb here. At the time, I wanted to count how many flows are, are in the mountain. Um, so that's how I'm, I'm advancing my database. And eventually, uh, uh, here's uh, back to the picture of Lundin's neck. Uh, this is the section I've done on the side of the of the cliff where the, the contact is. And I was very surprised to find between the white sandstone and then the basalt, a quite thick formation of uh, breccia, what, that, uh, yeah, what I've called breccia. So matrix supported um, fragments of basalt, sedimentary rocks, and that's about 60 meters. Uh, and it's, it's bedded. So um, I was very surprised to find this, um, this sedimentary, um, but now we, we know as a volcanic rock, especially after the presentation of John, uh, have many features of volcanic. Uh, so there is angular class uh, of basalts. There are some very thin, -led, uh, thin bedded uh, coarse sandstone and mudstone. I might be tough. So here's a detail of the section. It's, it's quite thick. It's not, uh, um, it's, it's not something you can miss, really. So, um, but I was unaware about the presence of all this uh, breccia. Here's another uh, very nice section at Belkop. It's a very nice climb to do. The farmer is also very um, accommodating. It's uh, from 1800 meters to 2100 meters. So it's about 300 meters of uh, vertical climb. It's very nice. And the rocks are very well exposed in many places. So on the left, you have my section. At the bottom, you have a white sandstone, and then above that, you have a very sharp contact with some um, uh, volcanic rock. In between this purple section is, uh, is again a breccia with some uh, sedimentary feature. Then you find more basalt, and again here towards the top, you find other sedimentary rock. So um, this really uh, differ from the view I had um, during my PhD at the, the contact between the the sandstone and the basalt was just like uh, a very nice uh, stratigraphic um, uh, conformity. There is a lot more to uh, learn with at the base of this uh, of this sequence. So here are the, the rocks in the field from uh, from this section. Here is the contact. So the sandstone has some strange uh, little class and beddings. Uh, uh, so here I'm asking the question, is it the Elliot formation? Because uh, Clarence is normally thought to be a Eolian, uh, Eolian unit. And then here above it, you have a very massive uh, volcanic rock. So it's difficult without a thin section to tell if it's a dolerite or a basalt. But anyway, it's just grind up into basalt and then grind up into this fantastic fascia here. Uh, 
where you see uh, a lot of different class and shapes and you found the very nice mud balls uh, as you can see in the more recent example of uh, Saint Helene in the presentation of uh, of John so um, yeah these are very uh, great fascists to 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 see uh, in South Africa and uh, as you continue the section uh, here's more pictures from the field you can see some erosion like here you can see some very nice bedded and uh, sandstone with ripples uh, thing down some uh, little uh, tracks of some sort by um, um, made by animals or or perhaps the rain and then here towards the top um here i think i have found a little layer of aeolian sandstone because of this uh, very well graded uh, lamination so there's lots of different uh, fascists and then once you're at the top you have a brilliant view on uh, what is called the Belmont uh, volcano that you can see here. So this place was very well mapped, uh, or very well mapped. It, uh, yeah, there is a map here on the corner by Locke. Uh, this is a very small uh, picture of his map, but he has it uh, big. The former Donnie actually has a, has a copy. And uh, I think Locke used to take his students and spend a lot of time here to, to map uh, what they call a volcano and mostly it's uh, andesite but um, um, yeah it's it's there and it's uh, for us to to explore uh, because really the work were done in the 70s so it's still maybe um, new things that we can test in this area um, here's a picture of uh, the little drone I use in the field because uh, sometimes it's not possible to climb the, the section as I showed and uh, with this drone, really, it's, you can uh, fly it up high or behind you uh, and then take pictures. And that's very useful uh, for mapping and even to give presentation and to communicate to people. So here's a picture taken by the drone. I think it shows very well and uh, it shows more than if I would have taken from my, uh, from my cell phone. But uh, you can see the, the white sandstone at the bottom. And here at the top where we were camping is uh, basalt. So you, you can see there is quite also a thick section of that makes uh, that makes the contact. So how does it uh, work? Is if I've got a, if I've got someone with me, I would ask him to use a binocular and to try to keep an eye on the drone because it's very easy to to lose it uh, in that particular place uh, because you are quite high. The air is thin. So the drone really struggle a bit more to fly and then there is a lot of turbulent air that uh, also uh, does not help flying the drone. Um, so I'll show you where I lost uh, my, my first drone. This is the second one I'm working with. Uh, here is a, a better picture taken from the drone. So we are here, you can see Kaya is using the binocular here to make sure I don't lose it. Or if I lose it, then we can try and go recover it. And then you see we have a very nice uh, vertical uh, facade of the of the outcrop. So that's very useful to to make your geological sketch. Uh, the basalt is on top, and then here in this section you can see some some tufts or volcanics that are intruding into a, a sandstone layer that is underneath the the basalt and which is above some other tufts. So which is well above. Uh, uh, this sort of uh, Clarence uh, white sandstone. So in the old days, uh, the sandstone by Detroit was called the cave, uh, the cave sandstone. Um, uh, it would be nice if we, could, if we could ask him if this sandstone within the volcanics was uh, referred as the cave, but I think the way I read this book is uh, the way you would describe the cave sandstone. But uh, yeah, nowadays, all of this now is part of the Drakensberg group. So uh, yeah, we have to, it's, it's uh, difficult in the field to map sandstone and uh, move away from uh, this uh, very enigmatic uh, Clarence formation. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's another, um, another this, this is a 3D model actually made by the, the drone. So there's different picture that are stitched together and now you can see it in semi 3D, so like Google Earth. And that show where we made our uh, geological section. Um, here at the bottom, you have some uh, some sedimentary rocks. That perhaps is the uh, Elliot formation. And then above, at the very top, you have some basalt, uh, which perhaps links to what is called the Lesotho formation, the very 
upper flow of uh, the Drakensberg group. So you can see in between, there is again like maybe 500 meter of section to describe with a lot of different fascias, some tufts, some uh, breccia, different kind of lava. And when you have a, a drone model like this, then it really helps you to decide where you're gonna go and uh, hike to try to find the outcrop. So that's very, very useful. I'll show again this picture a bit later. Um, so yeah, during all these uh, seven, eight years of uh, fieldwork, uh, I had the chance in 2016 to share some of it with uh, Martin uh, here in the bottom pictures. So we went together in the field. It was a really great, uh, great adventure. The first thing is that we were driving uh, our own 4x4. So we were two and we had two cars. So that was a little bit of fun. And uh, the goal was uh, the guy who's driving in, uh, in front will stop when he found something interesting. So at the other one at the back has to stop as well. Um, and uh, that's how we discovered some, um, uh, some very interesting rocks, some pillow lavas here. Uh, the height happened really is uh, uh, we were writing a book on the geomorphology of South Africa and I wanted to take a picture of this, uh, this meandering river here that you can see on the left near Log Bridge. So while I was busy uh, taking picture and admiring the, the landscape on the side of the road, there was a nice outcrop here with the pillow lava. And then when Martin uh, uh, recognized this, uh, this volcanic feature, uh, he was really excited and then that's how we really started working uh, more closely on this particular volcanic feature, uh, which I will now talk about. Uh, so yeah, we made that discovery in uh, June uh, 2016. Um, I think it was the first time I, was, uh, I went in the field uh, with Martin and uh, it was quite good because sometimes the sun go down and then you have to quickly find a place to, to camp. So yeah, it was more than just uh, was geology. It was uh, yeah, one or two weeks of very nice fun. Uh, in the Drakensberg. So here he is, uh, Martin taking the, the first picture of the pillow lavas. And uh, yeah, uh, we started the discussion about uh, how did this uh, volcanic uh, rocks uh, formed. Um, he told me that he has seen many of them. Um, the most common one, you found them in mid-oceanic ridge. So um, I was, uh, I've been puzzled a lot about this, uh, this, uh, this rock, so they form underwater, and then here I've got a little movie for those who have never seen underwater or it uh, go, it's taken from YouTube. There's even the sound. Uh, so yeah, it's recorded underwater, and then uh, it shows how the lava, uh, when it entering the, the water, it's uh, really making some balls. Um, I guess because of the shock of temperature and density. So we, really this, pic this picture is what we see here. So it, it's really one of the best proof in stratigraphy that uh, the lava erupted in water. Um, now the, the question, um, the following question <laughs> as a, a sedimentologist, I don't know why they want to, to always know why is it fresh or salt water? Uh, was it fresh or salt water? So yeah, most commonly you found them in the ocean. So the, the really the, the more easier model would be to have, um, to have them erupt in the, in the middle of the sea. But because we have this uh, really enigmatic clearance formation and, uh, and, and some aeolian feature, really people are, uh, even today, are really reluctant to uh, have this uh, extruded into, uh, into the sea. So at the time, I was thinking of this sort of environment. Here's a modern analog in Brazil where you have dunes, and then in between you, the dunes, you have the, the seawater or lakes. So um, I think it's, it's a bit far from the reality, but it's just a nice picture that I wanted to, to share with you. So I'm going to try to move on because I see now the time is going on, and I'm sharing my. Um, uh, here's some of my ideas. So here's uh, where you found the pillow lava. It's above this white sandstone and it's towards the bottom of the basalt. And really the, the constraint in age we have, they are in the Elliot formation. Um, I think Lara, if she's listening, she can uh, respond to some of your answer. I think they've dated very well the Triassic, Jurassic uh, boundary. So that's 201 uh, million years around there. 
and then the Dorite, which are very well dated at the place Bashian to Ocean boundary. So it's around 182 or 183 million years. So really we have 20, uh, almost 20 million years to play around here and uh, where there is um, a lot of uh, probably uh, erosion that could happen, especially here at the boundary between the, the sandstone and then the volcanics, as I've shown you in the, in the field. So that's some work we're doing with uh, some uh, American colleagues and following up the PhD of Thomas uh, Mwedi. We're dating some zircon from these volcanics and there's lots of uh, different age around 200 and it's really uh, a challenge to uh, to get the maximum depositional age because you have zircon of all sorts even in very well um, very well exposed tufts where you would thought oh there is a this is a, a very simple ash deposit. In fact, there's lots of, of reworking going on and it's very difficult to date the, the base of the Drakensberg group. But uh, yeah, so uh, the, the things we can do is to map it wherever there is pillow lavas and we found them, the more I go in the field, the more we found them everywhere. Now, so in, in green are the occurrence of pillow lavas. These are the reference where people have described them before us. You found them some in, uh, in the north of Southern Africa, you found some of them in uh, uh, Eastern Botswana, and then of course a lot here, uh, to the south of the Cape Val Craton in, uh, in the Drakensberg. Uh, so these are some of our new discovery in Lesotho's. And uh, yeah, remember, uh, we found them where there is exposure. There is a lot of area here where the basalt are covering the whole place, and possibly there is a, a lot more of pillow lava that uh, we cannot see because they are still covered by the by the basalt. So uh, there's uh, many, many places where you can find uh, these this rocks erupted in, in water. Uh, this is one of the northern um, uh, outcrop. Uh, it was very, very difficult to find. It was uh, described uh, in the old days and it took us a 24 hour hike. I was with a young owner student here, Cine, and we, we were crying actually when we had to come back. Uh, it was a very long hike. You had to go through different valleys. And it was in a, in, a, in a reserve where they didn't allow us to, uh, to drive closer to the outcrop. So we took us 24 hours to just get this little piece of rocks. Uh, but it was fun and a uh, good adventure. You can see these pillow lavas in many other places that are well more uh, well exposed. Uh, here you can see they are uh, covering this sandstone at uh, almost 1800 meters above sea level. Uh, there are different features of uh, intrusions. Uh, in other place, you found them at 1900. There is different pictures of how the, the pillows uh, uh, have been formed. Uh, again, it's very close to a white sandstone. And uh, yeah, here again, we go back to this place in Lesotho because you found the pillows here at uh, almost 2200 uh, meters. So they are at very different elevation. And um, that's uh, first of the structural problem to explain. In uh, one of the area that uh, uh, Kaya is mapping in Lesotho, there is a very nice well exposed fault where you can actually measure the displacement. And this is some of the tectonic feature that could have, uh, that can help to explain the difference in elevation uh, between the different pillows. So you can see the same volcanic breccia is about, it's been uplifted 300 meters compared to where it is on the other side of the fault. So this is his detailed map. Uh, what he's doing for his master. We also flown the drone here. He's planning to do some uh, geochemical analysis on this. Uh, again, there is a more detail on the different rock type. There is different type of basalt. In green is a tough uh, unit that is mapped here. And some dorites that uh, we also have to map uh, in detail. What are the content, the contact, and especially is there a relation with the, for this, this cross-cutting is a little bit strange. So we have to go back in the, in the field to continue mapping this. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, the, the 3D model we done uh, with the drone on the log bridge. Uh, so you can load it in, in Google Earth. It's very detailed, but what I wanted to share is that, uh, yeah, to make a, a 3D model with the drone of this uh, cliff, which is about 700 meter by 300 meter, it's, it's very difficult. So the drone is not very, uh, good to use in in very uh, um, complicated complex area like this uh, to to get your 
your panoramic pictures and your cross section it's uh, it's been really a challenge and that's why actually i lost the drone because the area is very is too big to cover and the relief is very uh, very hard so if your drone go around the mountain then you lose connection and then it disappear um so yeah this is about the maximum you can map in detail with the drone 500 meter is a more is a better size area so the the cross section is here um and uh, yeah um, what i would like to do is to be able to combine the geology with the drone uh, with the drone footage i'm not there yet especially on vertical cliff it's quite uh, difficult to to correct for um, rather than making a map but um, uh, a good way also to share is to uh, make movies so instead i'm going to show you a quick movie if i have time uh, otherwise you can find it online so that shows you how uh, where the pillows are and there is a little background music because that was around when Johnny De Craig uh, passed. So just to remember him, and uh, yeah, it, it was a cool, um, a cool movie to to do. And uh, now it's online, and I hope you'll stay there. And that student or people who don't have a chance to go in the field, they can get a better impression how it looks like. So here's uh, Keegan. He's walking the section. You can see there's lots of bedded uh, rocks. And as the drone will move uh, closer, you'll see better the, the pillows. So yeah, the pillows are very well exposed. You can see they are underlying some uh, sediments. And uh, this is really where we took most of our sample for the analysis. Um, so here Kigan is uh, just acting as a scale to make the movie more fun. Um, here are some more detailed pictures uh, of the contact between the, the pillows, the bubbles in the pillows. That's something I'll show you that we use to to study this outcrop and um, yeah the general uh, section you can see it's very easy it's along the road I think it's a famous section but um, yeah for some reason we had to discover it by ourselves so that make it even more fun okay so um, I still have a few slides to go through to finish the the story uh, how do i move on ah yeah so yeah when we went to collect the sample unfortunately uh, i went to again with martin but during winter so it's a south uh, facing cliff so you spend most of the day in the shade and really in the cold you can see it's uh, it's uh, cold everywhere or well, luckily one of the local let us stay in a, in a little house you found some interesting things but uh, yeah it was a very difficult uh, field work to break hard rocks when the when it's uh, minus uh, degrees, it's uh, and camping was uh, um, yeah, was quite a, also an adventure just to collect the samples. It is one of the better day when I was there in uh, in 2017 to show you the section. So at the base of the basalt, there is a, again a very nice blue uh, blue rocks. Yeah, a bread shelf. I think I've got a, a detail. Yeah, the the fascius is is beautiful. It's very very fine with a lot of different stone inside. And uh, this is overlaying uh, a sandstone, and then that's covered by the by the basalt. So before being covered, there is some more bedded, uh, very fine granite sediments, and here's some uh, cross bedded uh, fine sandstone. This is the contact. Uh, the sandstone is uh, cross bed of the sandstone is truncated by the by the lava. So it's a beautiful erosion here. And above, uh, above different type of basalts here, you found the pillow lava in between, uh, as I showed you on the movie, between sediments. And the sediments, again, have beautiful uh, lapidi. So uh, it's, um, it's uh, yeah, it, that shows the volcanic activity. So yeah, this is a picture in the lab. I had to cut a lot of sample, um, maybe 50 or 100. You want to get the more fresh part. And uh, yeah, you want to do some fin section, you want to make some powders. So for some of them, I was trying to avoid the bubbles. For some of them, I just collected the bubbles. So uh, we had quite a, a collection of samples. 
And the first thing we did with this uh, rock slab here is to uh, measure the bubbles. So if you measure the bubbles in different places, you can uh, plot them on a curve where the size of the bubble and then the number of bubbles are, are linked to the depths in, in water where the, the pillow erupted. So you can see there's a spread and uh, the average is like 500 meter of water for this pillow here. We did some uh, chemistry with uh, Martin's colleagues at the University of Bergen. So these are the results uh, plotted with over Karoo uh, volcanics. So the results are uh, similar to what people have found before. And we did some uh, oxygen isotopes on the, on the vesicles and uh, some strontium analysis. Uh, what we see on that graph of the strontium analysis in blue is the strontium composition of the water during the Jurassic. And our samples are very close. So we believe that this is a good indication that the pillow erupted uh, under uh, 500 of meter, but in the middle of, uh, of the sea and not in a small lake as most people uh, would, like to, uh, would like it to be for Southern Africa. So that's, if this interpretation is correct, then we have to completely change uh, the global map of uh, this time at 183. And that's what I've done here on this very famous map done by the American. I've added a lot of water here in the, in the Karoo. And um, uh, this is really what uh, creates a lot of discussion uh, amongst geologists in, uh, in South Africa is why would we have uh, the ocean at this time in this part of the, of the world? Um, so, um, but if it's correct, if we have, uh, if the volcanism occur a lot in the, under the sea, this will correlate a lot better with the, the extension that people are working, uh, for example, here in Europe or in other places of the world and that they can measure uh, in, the, in the fossil record and in different kind of isotopes where they can see that there has been a, a big change in the, in the global ocean uh, at around uh, 183 million years. So we, we think it's a better um, and more fitting uh, interpretation. Uh, to have the, the sea um, during the breakup between West and uh, East Gondwana. Now to, to support that further, we are using, uh, we compare this to the Afar Triple Junction in uh, North Africa, where there are a lot of basalt that are around, dated around 30, uh, 40 million years, which are flanked by some uh, really early uh, oceanic crust in the Red Sea. So this is uh, the tectonic model on the right. You can see there is different rift. Uh, there are some transformed fault. All this area has been uh, moved under the sea level actually. And uh, yeah, in cross section, we don't really know much. Is it uh, uh, is really the geology across this area, but in simple terms, you have a rift, you have some volcanics at the top, and then at depths, you have some, uh, some basic intrusive. So we think it is very, very similar to what we can uh, described in the field in the Karoo. And uh, yeah, to end up, uh, here's a picture of um, uh, the Alaita uh, volcano, so in North Africa. And um, I cannot read, the lava field are affected by fracture uh, and recent flows are coming out here of the rift there. So and in this landscape, you see there is not much uh, trees and not much water. Uh, except in the in the fracture, so the dry surface do not offer much life. However, the the fissure and normal fault produce some lowland where the aeolian sediments or anything terrestrial can can be stuck in, and uh, the vegetation can uh, grow a little bit. So this comes from a book uh, which I have here, uh, Geology of East Africa. I don't know if you can see it. But I would recommend to uh, read it. It's a, it's a very beautiful book that um, uh, it's, it's quite uh, going to be good to use for a comparison with the, the Karoo volcanic. So uh, um, that's all uh, what I've talked about is written in a paper that uh, Martin uh, wrote uh, before he passed away in March last year. Uh, it's titled Pillow Talk. And he said it's in acknowledgments to Doris Day. Uh, unfortunately, I was not here when he was watching that, uh, that series with Doris, but, and I still not completely understand why he called this pillow talk, but uh, maybe you do from this presentation. 
and uh, he would have liked to uh, for this pilotop to have uh, this picture of the book by Jules Verne to be the cover. I uh, didn't manage to, to get that. I was not strong enough with the editor, I guess. And But as a, an acknowledgement, I was able to get some of his notes on the, on the manuscript. He had, he said, one of his main goal with this paper is to encourage new uh, South African geologists that the Karoo is a great place to map, many of which still depend on the map of Dutile. And it is time to move on uh for south africa and by south africa so it's really i understand this message that we really need to go in the field and continue uh to map especially because it's fun i think that's uh yeah what, where i want to leave it i hope it was not too long and that uh, we can have some discussion um, thanks everyone thanks bastian and, and good on your timing well done and most of all, I must commend you on the fact that you, as Martin, um, wish to be done. You've been out there, you know, mapping and, and remapping areas that, you know, some of us sort of thought we had all the answers and are sacrosanct and we, we shouldn't go back and relook at it. Anyway, so that's the first point. Second point also, obviously, your diagrams and field mapping is just fantastic. And the fact that you're getting, you know, young students out, out there is even better. Um, you can't learn geology, as we all know, in front of a computer screen. So, so, so well done and all that. And, and I find your, your model fascinating. And I'm sure there will continue to be, you know, discussion and argument on it. So let's, um, let's get some discussion going from, from whoever out there, including some of our young geologists on the, on the talk. Uh, Je Jeffrey, I mean, you want to you want to actually come in and talk about it, your point on the strontium isotopes. Hi, yeah, sure. Um, hi, Jeff. Hi, how's it going? All right, so you're, at UCT. you're, you're an igneous petrologist at UCT. Is that yeah, right? that's correct. Okay, great. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Hi, Bastian. Thanks for the thanks for the talk. I guess you didn't really talk too much about the isotopes, but I'm. I guess I'm more interested in the, in the Karoo lavas. Um, and I guess it's quite well constrained in that part of the world that the strontium isotope ratios are quite radiogenic and typically interpreted to reflect crustal assimilation when the magmas are coming through the crust. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, how you can discriminate between crustal assimilation and seawater alteration um, affecting the isotopes? Yeah, I'm not a uh, joke chemist uh, specialist yet um, we had some uh, we had a specialist on pillow lavas who really uh, looked at all this data my understanding was that we use uh, stable isotopes to uh, constrain a little bit or to discriminate a little bit what you're talking about and we are using some models i think uh, the igneous petrologists like to have different uh, group of crusts put them together and then you come up with a number and then you know how many percent of each rocks has been assimilated into the, the process. But I, I understand we, we, do, uh, we do mention that as the magma moved up to the surface, it did, uh, it did assimilate over material. Uh, but we really think that the uh, seawater had, had an impact on the, on the results. And um, this is, seawater is mostly because we found this pillow lava everywhere. So, uh, people have done maybe a lot of geochemical analysis everywhere, but they didn't really describe the, the stratigraphy and, and make, a, make nice maps of the different type of basalt that exist. And um, so, yeah, there's lots of complexity. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's only what I got from, um, from this. These are really initial results uh, from our, from our uh, group. We, we would like to do a lot more analysis, but it takes so much time. Okay. Yeah. And Jeff, your comments and view? Yeah, I would also just suggest the oxygen, I mean, would also be affected by crustal assimilation, right? We could also drive that up to higher delta 18 you know, values. So yes. I, I find it a bit difficult to, to interpret those ratios as seawater alteration relative to crustal assimilation, um, just because crustal assimilation seems like a more reasonable answer, I guess. It's just I guess a lot more work has to be done to try and figure that out. And, and if you look at the whole Lesotho remnant, uh, my understanding is that the whole remnant has quite a radiogenic strontium isotopes. You'd have to contaminate the whole sequence with seawater 
the seawater then if, if my understanding is correct. Um, so I, I would just caution hesitance in terms of using oxygen, heavy Delta 80 no to, to, to suggest seawater because there are, there are other ways to do it. And I know Chris Harris has worked a lot with Delta 80 no and the Kuru lavas at the moment showing that there's potential for recycled, a recycled crust in the source as well to affect Delta 80 no. So there are just a few ways to do it rather than just seawater alteration, I think. Okay, and and for me, for me, the fascinating thing is is um, those sediments, Bastian. I mean, are there other other features? Uh, you've obviously looked at the sediments. Maybe not not a lot of them because you still have constraints on the number of outcrops you've seen. But you know, is there any way you can distinguish between sort of a, a marine, you know, oceanic setting in, in the sedimentology or the features compared to you know, the, the past models were sort of e ephemeral lakes, um, small localized lakes, um, you know, and, and perhaps the odd stream at the base or, or in that sort of um, transition zone. But is anything from sedimentology or, or, or the actual composition of the sediments that can tell you it's, it's a, of more, more of a marine type composition or marine source? Yeah, that's that's more my field, and uh, yeah, um, uh, people have asked me this uh, question before. Um, well, uh, about the sediments, uh, I forgot. I forgot the answer. Um, but uh, yeah, there is there is little uh, little fossils. So I mean, I, um, I didn't do enough tests to see if actually they are fossil preserved. But in terms of uh, sedimentary structure, yes, there is a lot of uh, sedimentary structure that indicate water. And this is a, a already a, an important find because uh, the general picture we have is that most of the sediments are aeolian. And uh, just to discuss that it's, it's a little, uh, it's, it, as it's, it, will, it will be difficult to change the mind of, uh, of, the, ge of the old geologists because they want it to be uh, uh, Sahara Desert, and I would have liked to also, but uh, um, uh, now, so now they came up with that more improved model, but it's a Sahara, okay, but in small places we have little lakes, so it's not completely a Sahara, but it's, it's still, so it's not, it's not really um, working for me, I think it's, uh, it's better to have a, a modern analog, and I think the, the AFA is, is a great, uh, it's a great farm that, uh, that Martin did, and that's um, I want to to continue support. So yeah, there's lots of sedimentary structure to study, and um, maybe some footprints in between the the lava flows. But uh, it's uh, definitely not aeolian uh, between the lavas. And if it's ephemeral lake or uh, a big sea of in the sediment, it's difficult to to tell. But I think when we we'll have all the different aspect of the geology around this, I think we can uh, come up with a better solution than just having a, a desert where the lava just come and then cover everything and then the story is finished. Yeah, now as an old geologist and having worked extensively on the Karoo, I think that's that's an absolute given that needs to be, you know, thoroughly reinvestigated and pulled apart and, you know, hope, hopefully there will be new models and that applies to every one of our geological sequences in Southern Africa. You know, all, all of us old geologists probably did some reasonable work, but we didn't have the tools and 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 information you know that's available today and um, and we've got to we've got to do more like you're doing okay further 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 questions jock jock Harmer, you've got any comments yeah my comment would just be that you know the, the pillar lava is a quite convincing evidence of water there's a big difference between having bits of water around that they float into and a, a huge ocean you know, if you just look at the geological setting of that part of the, the Karoo, the, the surrounding rocks below it, I mean, how do you create an, an ocean? It doesn't really fit the Afar Triangle at all, the, the surrounding geology, in my, in my view. Mm. And okay, I think the, the vesicle things is not a, it's not a very solid piece of, you know, uh, constraints on the whole, on the whole model. And so I'd just caution against, against taking that too far, really. You know, it's a, I think it's a bit of a red herring, but the detailed mapping that um, you know that you've been doing there is excellent, and and uh, documenting just how much of the you know what what the volume of pillowed lava is is is, is important. You know, 
but mm -hmm. I don't see evidence for it needing to be a, a deep ocean. I can uh, reply to that. Uh, I think today we, we are next to the ocean. So there's good evidence that the ocean came here and, and we have to move on from uh, the model where there is no sea. And then we don't know what happened. And then today, suddenly we are on the east coast uh, of, the, of the African continent. The, the ocean got created at some stage and it, and it got created very close to this part of the stratigraphy. Uh, even a little bit before the contact or a little bit after, but it's, it's part of the story. How do you open the Indian Ocean? And if you only have lakes, then how do you explain today the Indian Ocean is here addressed by uh, Paul Elizabeth? And I think we may find some evidence uh, about how did it open. And um, um, yeah, part of my research now is going more into uh, doing the geology under the sea because some of the answers were, were, are under the Indian Ocean, but we really have to get a better a breakup model for the Indian Ocean and a lot of research groups are after that and for us it's just at the at our doorstep so um, yeah I think we we have to be more open and then uh, really move on from uh, uh, this old geology. I think a problem is that we, we still call this the Karoo but maybe the, the Drakensberg erupted it was Africa already so there's a, a, a bit of a, a jump between uh, the Gondwana and then the two-day geology that is lying very close to this uh, stratigraphy and we really have to tackle that problem because everywhere in the world there is a lot of people who work on breakup models and climate change and uh, we can certainly uh, bring some field data into, into their model. And I can tell you the model in America for Southern Africa are completely wrong. And uh, you may not like me putting the sea in the Karoo, but it's a lot of improvement compared to, I mean, they, they just put a piece of land everywhere because they have no idea what it is. But we know that the, the breakup opened very close to, uh, to the Drakensberg. So we, we must uh, improve our models. Yeah. And, and Bastian, there's an important connection that we need to make. I mean, it, it, he's busy running his restaurant in, in um, Claremont as we speak, but John Milan, who's worked extensively in the oil and gas business and looked at the the conjugates and the, and the breakup of, of Southern Gondwana land, particularly, you know, how South America fitted together where, where um, the Falklands came from. And, and he's got some amazing data sets as the oil and gas companies would have. Um, and, and you should, we, we must definitely put you in touch with, with Jean. In fact, we'll get him to give his talk again this year that he gave last year, but he, he'd be a great person um, with access to lots of, of modern data, you know, collected um, offshore in, in these different basins. And, and he, I'm sure, you know, would be a big asset for you to talk to in terms of, you know, looking at these models, which you're talking about. So, so we'll make that connection for you as well. He's a great guy. Hi, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks for the talk, Bastian. I was really interested to hear what you had to say and, and the fieldwork photos were amazing. I was just wondering, um, and I, I wrote it in the comment bar, but what I've seen in the field, as you know, I've done a lot of fieldwork in the crew and, and have visited some of the places that you've actually mentioned. And we see, at least in the lowermost part of the Drakensberg group that you do, as you've seen, have these interbedded lava flows and sandstones with pillow lavas. But the pillow lavas often aren't, don't have a very large lateral extent. And then the sedimentary structures that we see with the sandstones indicate sort of flowing water, shallow flowing water at least. So you might have, from a sedimentological perspective, in the lowermost part of the Drakensberg, which remember, you have to disconnect now from the Clarence. You may have had aeolian deposition during the Clarence, but even in the uppermost Clarence, we see a lot of features in some sections that show that you had more humid climate conditions more flowing water, less aridity. So at least in the lowermost part of the Drakensberg, I think there's a disconnect between the paleoenvironmental setting and what we saw in the Clarence, at least in the lowermost or middle part of the Clarence where you have more Aeolian conditions. So I was wondering, how do you account for the sedimentary structures indicating flowing water? Yes, maybe some standing, larger standing bodies of water indicating lakes in which you could potentially form pillows as well. Um, and your hypothesis of this being more an open marine setting. Thanks. 
a large franchise where are you or um where, where are you based and uh, you... <laughs> i was at the university of johannesburg and okay. uct and yeah. now i am in um the jurassic museum in switzerland oh wow okay fantastic thanks. Go on, Bastian. Yeah. yeah thanks lara uh, pleased to meet you even if i don't see you but uh <laughs> The answer is uh, very simple, is uh, to explain some of this problem that you have is that uh, uh, there is very good evidence in that stratigraphic record that there is a lot of erosion and unconformities. So there is no problem of having different environments uh, at different time over 20 million years. And um, I think the, the problem I have also with the, with the students is, is to move on from that a theoretical model where we have a Sahara desert and then we have lava and then we imagine things are happening one after another, which is not the case. There's lots of stratigraphic gaps and yattices and, and there's plenty of them and not only on one surface above the Clarence sandstone, as you suggest, there's a lot of different uh, stratigraphic gaps in that lower part of the sequence before the lava really come pouring one after another. And maybe when they're pouring one after another, maybe there's also big gaps there. So I reckon, uh, yeah, we'll find a lot more different environments and different uh, uh, structure that will tell us a little bit about different times, but it's certainly not continuous in my opinion, from the Eolian sedimentation to, uh, to the eruption of basalts and then suddenly having a, uh, an ocean. I think there is a lot of uh, mystery in that very condensed uh, record. Um, can I just interject? Uh, how would you feel then about the Muir et al. paper from 2020, where he talks about the recalibration of the breakup history of southwestern Gondwana? So if that model could be applied uh, further up the coast, uh, you could still have continuous sedimentation through Clarence into the low low, most Drakensberg group where you would have still terrestrial settings, but then you have the later development of marine conditions or marine, a marine setting. Um, so, and in that paper, he shows at least in the Southwest, you still have almost continuous breakup of Gondwana <laughs> and the deposition within the main Karoo Basin from the um, early Jurassic uh, into the middle Jurassic. So. Couldn't that model be applicable to further up the coastline too? I don't know. I don't know if I'm making sense there, but and I don't know if you know the paper I'm referring to. Yeah, no, um, I'm sorry. I would be very happy if you could send the, the paper to me. I'm not aware of that. And uh, yeah, I'll share yeah, it in the I'll share it in the comment. We can imagine things that are continuous, but in geology, it's most likely the opposite. In general, it's very discontinuous, and we have very little um, little things to work with. So I'm more of the uh, of an alternative model. Yes, I agree. I think there are a lot of hiatuses. Um, I agree with that, but I just think, yeah, anyway, I, I shared the paper. Maybe you can comment. Yeah, I would on. like to be in touch. Thank you. Yeah, and Laura, will you send us your email address? It'd be great to get you sort of to connected and get you to give us a presentation sometime. Oh, sure. No problem. Okay. Okay, but, uh, I mean, that's all great stuff. Um, Rosemary, just to answer your question, I mean, the, the Karoo, as, as we see it today, is just sort of, you know, parts of a much bigger carapace that covered most of, of Southern Africa. And I think that's the question you were asking, you know, are there other portions and, and areas that also need, need to be looked at? And, and I think the answer is yes. Um, there's a there's a huge amount of material that should still be re-looked at, you know, including the whole of the Labombo Mountains um, up our coast or east coast along the Mozambique boundary. All right, anything else? Uh, uh, Bastien, won't, in, in two minutes, won't you just um, summarize for us, Aeon, and, and what you guys are doing there, apart from, you know, doing some great training of young students? Uh, um, quick, quick, um, quick recap of your, your institute. Yeah, if I can uh, share my screen again, I'll show you the picture that recap. Can you see this picture? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is the recap of our group uh, that was created by Martin, Africa Earth Observatory Network. So this is now moving into a new type of uh, science that we call Earth Stewardship Science. So we're trying to move on from the basic uh, geology and uh, igneous uh, petrology to 
a more embracing uh, geoscience where we can have people from different background to work together. So I'm uh, supervising uh, six students at the Nelson Mandela University under that group. Um, and they, uh, there is only one student that does this really hard work uh, mapping of the volcanics. The other ones are working on two uh, material uh, construction with some local communities. Uh, yeah, one of them is developing drone uh, technology for for mapping some uh, rock painting. Uh, there is uh, a student from the Council of Geoscience who's working on uh, erosion feature in Niam Tata. So we're trying to integrate more of the social uh, aspect uh, and because we believe it is the way forward. So um, yeah, um, we are uh, of course uh, uh, under this lockdown situation struggling to stay in touch. Um, I think having online meetings like this is good. We're also doing it with our students. I think today we have about uh, still 20 or 20 students from different faculties and different universities in South Africa, uh, supervised by many different uh, colleagues of Martin. And uh, yeah, I believe we can uh, continue this, uh, this institute and this type of research. Um, from my side, I'm not sure yet how, but I have one or two years to figure out uh, what's the next uh, big research I want to work on. Our, our last big research was on the Karoo because of the shale gas uh, development. So we have written quite a few uh, reports and articles about uh, the Karoo natural environment, the heritage, the social issue that uh, we have in the Karoo and the possibility of having uh, shale gas. Um, okay. But thank, thanks, Bastian. Thanks for, you know, it's a, it's a lively topic and um, we really appreciate your, your um, contribution and let's keep the discussion going because it sure does lead, need a lot more discussion. And, and us old timers really welcome these, you know, new ideas, even if they seem to be a bit out the box initially. Yeah, no, thanks, John. I would appreciate if uh, people can get in touch with me the more... Uh information I can get the, the best. Fantastic, yeah. Uh, thank you much, uh, very much everybody. We see you all next Thursday for our next talk.